since it's uh, 1130 in Newfoundland, I wanted to go ahead and, um, uh, and be respectful of our presenter's time. Um, Mackie, if you, you can go ahead and start sharing if you wish, uh, that would be fantastic. But um, this, is a, this is a presentation I have been looking forward to for some time now. Um, I've, I've already shared um, uh, the uh, most excellent and right worship brother Max, um, uh, you know, resume uh, previously. Um, so I'm not going to go into that uh, because it, it, it is rather it is rather extensive. He is a uh, I will I will I will mention that he is a uh, he is a, he is a past most uh, he is a past. Um, come on, Jim, Grand High Priest of the Grand Chapter of Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, and at the time of uh, of the story that he's going to tell, I believe he was Grand Chaplain of the Grand Lodge of, of Newfoundland as well. Uh, so this is pretty exciting. But before I go ahead and get started with this, I do rec want to recognize that we have some people here. Uh, first things first, want to recognize the presence of our Sovereign Grand Inspector General, uh, most worshipful and illustrious brother Al Jorgensen. Al, pleasure to have you here. Uh, we also have some, some really cool visitors. Uh, right Worship Brother Moses Gomez, who has been a presenter for us on multiple occasions. Grand Historian of the Grand Lodge of New Jersey is with us. Checking in all the way from New Jersey. Good to have you here. Uh, we also have uh, Most Worship Brother Barry Birch, who was Grand Master of uh, uh, Grand Lodge of BC Yukon, I believe 2018, 2019. That is correct. And of course, uh, past Grand Master of the of the Grand Lodge of Newfoundland and Labrador, Most Worship Brother Ian Murray, uh, 2018 to 2020, if, if, if I have that right. That's correct, Most Worship okay. Fantastic. So it's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, we all remember the 9-11 attacks. One of the untold stories, actually it was told on multiple occasions, but sometimes it gets lost in the ether, is that, when, is that 38 planes were diverted from U.S. airspace uh, to the tiny town of Gander. Now, some of you are familiar with Gander. Some of you are familiar with Gander. It, it, was, it, it used to be basically... Uh, a centralized airport for a lot of transcontinental travel. Of course, as 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 the planes were able to get more capacity, fuel wise, you know that kind of that kind of went away. Uh, and so you still had Gander. You still had Gander International Airport there. And the the, the ironic thing about it is there was talk of them getting rid of the airport. What they what were they going to do with it? All of a sudden, this happens. And one of the things that you'll hear in the opening line of the Broadway musical Come From Away is that everyone who was there when those planes showed up had a story to tell. And my, I'm absolutely pleased that uh, uh, most excellent and right worship brother Mac is here to tell us some of the stories. Um, Mac actually is the author of a book uh, entitled Flown Into the Arms of Angels. And Mac, I do hope that when that book actually becomes published that you'll share with us information how, on how to get it because I want to go ahead and get it. But uh, just think about this, folks. 7,000 people showed up in a town of a population of, I believe, 9,600. And what these folks did to open up their arms, open up their hearts, open up their homes is absolutely amazing. So with that, most excellent, right, worshipful sir, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> as, as Jim mentioned, I, I just submitted a book to the publisher a couple of months ago, and it will be published sometime in the next couple of months. I don't have a date yet uh, for the publication, but as soon as it, I know, uh, I'll communicate it to Jim and, and how to get it. Matter of fact, at the end of this presentation, the, the publisher has given me some information I can share. Uh, first of all, I didn't set out to, to write a book. Uh, I mean, I was involved with the, the College of the North Atlantic on, on September 11th, 2001. I was the administrator of the Gander campus. And uh, I, I had been interviewed a number of times following 9-11 by different media. And if you go on, on the website and you Google Mac Moss 9-11, you know, a number of stories will, will, will pop up. But uh, about three years ago, I said, I better write this stuff down while I still got my mind. And, <laughs> and before a computer crash wipes out all of the, the notes that I had. 
And uh, so when I began writing, I quickly discovered I didn't have the whole story. I mean, I knew what happened at, at my college uh, and I knew basically what happened next door to the college because there's a large high school that had 350 passengers. And down the road, another hundred yards or so, there's a, a, a junior high school. They had, you know, a couple of hundred uh, special wish kids and, and their caregivers. But I didn't know the upfront piece, what they did at the airport, what they did at the town, what the different agencies, the RCMP or the military or Salvation Army, Red Cross, what these people did. I, I, had, I had no idea. And for 20 years, basically, or 18 years, I was afraid to ask, afraid that I found out that it was just pure dumb luck that, that allowed us to respond in, in the way we did. But when I started uh, my inquiries and started talking to people in these organizations, I found out that, you know, there's a, an absolutely remarkable upfront piece that nobody had talked about. And that is the way that Newfoundland in general and the communities and the airports and the different agencies were prepared for this event and they didn't know it and nobody knows and the public still doesn't know it. And so I'm hoping with my book that uh, I'll get the, the story out there. But what I discovered was uh, <coughs> what I call untold stories and, and there's hundreds or thousands of them because uh, as Jim mentioned, everybody involved whether they brought a casserole or brought a pillow or a blanket or, or took someone home for a shop. Everybody has a story. And uh, in, in my book, I probably tell a couple hundred of, of these stories, uh, probably a bit less than that, but uh, you know, you, you gotta stop somewhere. You can't, you can't put them all in there. Uh, and my book is not only about Gander, uh, Gander, you know, played a significant part, but there, there were uh, 79 aircraft diverted to Newfoundland Airport. So 27 in, in St. John's, uh, 38 to Gander, 8 to Stephenville International Airport, 1 to Deer Lake Airport, and uh, I think 7 to uh, the military base in, in, in Goose Bay. And uh, as far as, as you know, the, the passenger hosting is concerned. A lot of the story has been told in magazine articles, newspaper articles, and uh, TV production, so on. But the most popular version, I guess, is is uh, portrayed in the, the musical Come From Away. And uh, that was touring North America. It was playing on Broadway. It was playing in, uh, in the UK and in Australia before the pandemic shut everything down. But that uh, musical, and it has to combine sort of everybody's story in a, in a one hour presentation. That musical only deals with eight uh, of the, the people from Gander and you know, only a, you know, a half a dozen of the organizations that, that helped out. And in central Newfoundland that took passengers from Gander International Airport, there's 42 different sites that hosted passengers. And so in my book, I've got all of those. In St. John's, there was uh, 20 or more places that hosted passengers. I have their stories. Stephenville, uh, similar number. And Deer Lake, there was only one aircraft, but it was an important one. And uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, I have their story as well in the book. But no matter where the planes landed, the passengers received the same sort of, of treatment. And at the end of this, uh, at the end of this uh, slide uh, presentation, I'll give you a few of the, the quotes I got. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. And uh, this is my cover of, of, of the book. Uh, I say my cover because the publisher is gonna do their own, but this is something I put together to have, to have a cover uh, you know, for, for my own purposes. And uh, Jim explained the, the situation where, where the planes landed. So I'll, I'll skip over some of that, but I want to show you uh, this slide, uh, which gives you the airports in Canada to handle the aircraft and the number of aircraft that landed at each airport. Uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia had 47 aircraft and 
approximately 8,000 passengers. Gander had 38 uh, aircraft, 6,700 passengers. Vancouver uh, in British Columbia had 8,500, uh, 34 aircraft, 8,500 passengers. And St. John's International Airport had 27 aircraft, 4,200 passengers. Uh, Stephenville had eight aircraft. Canadian Forces Goose Bay had seven and Deer Lake had one aircraft. And I'll speak about the Deer Lake one because it's, it's a story that nobody, nobody has told. Uh, that was a private aircraft, a Gulfstream jet that was owned by the AON Corporation. And uh, the president and, and CEO of AON, that's a huge insurance company, you know, one, of the, one of the largest insurance brokers in the world, I guess. But the president CEO was on that aircraft. They were diverted to Deer Lake. Uh, what most people don't know, and the story hasn't been told, is that AON Corporation had 1,100 employees in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. So this guy was stranded in Deer Lake. He wasn't allowed to fly to the US, to Chicago, his own base. Uh, so he had to get special permission from Transport Canada to fly to Sarnia, Ontario, and his people drove uh, from Chicago to Sarnia by car and picked him up and took him home. So I've got that story that, you know, that it's an untold story. So that's that's the basically the, the name of my book. Uh, uh, just a couple other things before I get into the College of the North Atlantic piece. Uh, there were 242 aircraft uh, total uh, diverted to Canada. Now 16 of them were domestic flights, Air Canada and some other uh, Canadian Airlines that were returning, you know, that morning, not for domestic flights. But a little bit about Nav Canada, which is uh, the navigation uh, control, air navigation control service uh, for Canada. Its Atlantic Area Control Center is in Gander, and they control all the air navigation over the western half of the North Atlantic. And approximately 1,300 uh, Air, transatlantic air flights pass through every day through the, the Gander Area Control Center airspace. So once the US closed its, uh, its airspace, Nav Canada had to count, contact all of the aircraft and divert them to the nearest airport that could accommodate them. Uh, on the West Coast, it was Vancouver and, uh, and, and the Yukon. Uh, flights already in the air in Canada were allowed to continue to their destination as long as they didn't overfly the United States. But everything else, nothing was allowed to take off. Everything on the ground was allowed to take off. <clears throat> so one of the reasons I wrote this book was to tell the stories of the organizations and the thousands of people, not only in Gander, but in uh, all of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, who looked after the 79 aircraft, the 13,000 passengers, an air crew, and uh, you know the book tells the story basically of how how we did that. Let me let me show you a slide of Gander because give you some appreciation. This is uh, an aerial photograph of Gander Airport, probably in 1943, 1944, and you can see these little crosses on the airport are fighter and bomber aircraft that were being ferried across the Atlantic. Uh, you know, to, to uh, serve in the war against, uh, against Germany. And uh, in that picture, there's probably 125, 130 aircraft. And this was a, a daily occurrence. I mean, there's flight after flight of, of, of uh, bombers and fighters being ferried across the North Atlantic. That's one of the, the pictures. So Gander at the time was one of the largest airports in the world. And you can see in this one, although it's a bit fuzzy, the uh, the layout of, of the airport. You could land in any direction, but you know, huge big aprons for these, uh, for these aircraft and hangars for repair of the aircraft. This is Gander during the, the in the afternoon of 9-11, of 2001. And in that picture, somewhere there's 38 or more uh, large aircraft. Every, every available space was, was pretty well taken up. Uh, with, with aircraft. And this is an aerial photograph, a Google Earth shot of, of Gander. 
Andy Airport. And so Gander is not, not a very large town. The population is probably 11,000 now or so. But the town of Gander could easily fit within the footprint of, of the airport. And uh, so, you know, we're only seconds. I mean, I live on the western edge of Gander. You can see my cursor right up on this little pond. I live up here. And we're nine minutes from the airport, keeping within the speed limit. So it's, it's uh, you know, we're not very far away. Uh, there's a, a remarkable story, as I said earlier, of the, of the way that Gander and St. John's and Stephen were prepared. And with all their infrastructure, all their organizations, they didn't know how well they were prepared. I mean, the airport had its own emergency management plan. And that was generally if, uh, you know, if a hard landing or a medical response or something like that, they had, they had plans for all of these, these things. Uh, the town of Gander and all surrounding towns had their own plans, mostly to deal with events like forest fires and uh, I'll just stop sharing for a moment. The forest fires and, uh, and other uh, events, uh, towns near rivers had plans, you know, to deal with flooding and so on. Uh, you know, the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, police had their own plans. The, there's a military base in Gander, they had their own uh, response plans. The Red Cross, knew what they had to do. The Salvation Army knew what they did. But nobody had put it all together because nobody ever anticipated in their wildest, wildest dreams that they would have to deal with 38 large aircraft, 6,700 passengers, all alive, all well, no medical problems, no, no aircraft problems. And nobody ever dreamed that they would have to host these people for four or five days. So that was a, that was a, a, a a major test of, of all their, their plans. Uh, I'm going to start sharing again because I just want to show you the, uh, these, these are the planes that landed in, in Gander that day. Uh, the first one in was the Continental Airlines. American airspace was closed at 11, 12 uh, Newfoundland time. And the first aircraft to land at Gander was at three minutes to 12, uh, you know, three minutes before noon uh, on that day. And, you know, before, during that time, Gander would see maybe eight or 10 private jets a day, uh, 10 or 12 commercial flights a day. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a very busy airport. And all of these aircraft, these 38 aircraft landed within three hours, just a little over three hours. And they were landing, you know, uh, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes apart, uh, all on one runway because one of the runways had been taken for parking, so they're 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 using the uh, the longest runway, and only one of these aircraft had to do a, a, a touch and go because of the aircraft in front hadn't rolled off on the taxiway, so this was a busy day for for Gander for Gander Airport. Uh, I'm going to skip over to uh, start the college piece because that's my involvement and uh, I'll see where, where my slides take me. Here we go. This is the, the College of the North Atlantic, the campus in Gander. You can't see a, a lot of it in one photograph, but it's the best, the best I could do. So I'll start my, my story. Uh, <sighs> The college uh, year at the campus had just started a week before, on the Tuesday, a week before 9-11. And at the time, we were teaching aircraft maintenance, aircraft structure repair, uh, hair styling, uh, automotive service programs, two automotive service programs. We we're teaching uh, first year technology programs. We we're teaching uh, commercial cooking the culinary program. We were teaching uh, uh, licensed practical nurses. And uh, so we had just, just started. So most of the students were still settling in. And uh, I got a call from a, from a secretary who happened to be listening to a radio. She said, 
She asked me if I had a radio in the office. I said, no. She said, well, a plane just crashed into one of the World Trade Towers at the World Trade Center. So I, I got out of my office, went to the staff room, turned on the television, and just in time to watch the second plane go in. So very quickly, the, the campus came to a standstill as everybody crowded around the available televisions and radios listening to, to what happened. And uh, you know, we didn't know at, at the college how it would affect us. So we, we were going about our, our business after that initial shot. Of course, everybody was talking about it. Uh, now, I'm, a, I'm an amateur radio operator, and as a member of the local ham club, we've participated with the airport in several emergency response simulations. And uh, I'll stop sharing for a moment. Several emergency response simulations. And, but these simulations normally involve an aircraft crashing at or near Gander Airport, some casualties, some injured, some wandering away into the brush. And, uh, you know, but in, in their wildest dreams, nobody ever taught to plan for 38 jumbo jets arriving within a couple of hours with close to 7,000 live passengers. But that was the situation we faced on the morning of September 11. As Jim said, the population of Gander was roughly 9,600, 9,700 people, and our population had virtually doubled in a few hours. Now, Gander had, at the time, about 500 hotel rooms and half of them were occupied with normal domestic traffic. So the town had to come up with a plan to house, feed and care for all of these people sitting at the planes at the airport. Uh, around 1 p.m. I got a call from Jake Turner who was the town manager and he was also the manager of the emergency operations center. And uh, they were polling the various institutions and organizations to see if anyone would be willing to take one or more plane loads of passengers overnight. We, we had no idea how long it was, they were going to be. Matter of fact, when he called me, he didn't even know if the planes would be overnight. But he, you know, they were, they were ahead of the game here. And I said, well, we can take, you know, probably 300 people because our normal campus student load is 200, 250. So I said, we certainly make room for 300 people if we clear the desk away. And uh, he said, well, I'll call you back if I need you. And uh, so at 3.30, once the students had, had uh, left for the day, I called the staff together and uh, we divided them up in teams and, and, you know, each team was given an assignment. And, uh, you know, if we got a call that we'd have to take passengers and the, the team leaders would be called and they would call out their other members. At seven in the evening, I was home watching the news with my wife, Nellie, when I got a call from Jake at the Emergency Operations Center and he told me we would be receiving approximately 280 passengers from an Air France flight and that they'd be arriving at 8.30. So you know, we had basically an hour and a half notice. So I called up the team leaders. Team one, the first, the most important one, was commercial cooking. We had two professional chefs as instructors and 16 students who had never been in the kitchen. You know, they had spent their first week learning first aid and, uh, you know, the various uh, other things they need to orient to, to their profession. So we called the first team and their job was to go immediately to the grocery stores gather up enough food, water, cereal, fruit, juice, snack food, energy bars, whatever they could get, and to get us through the next 24 hours. And get enough food for 300 people. <laughs> That's a lot of work for, for 18, 20 people. Team number two, computers and electronics, start stringing coaxial cable because we only had a couple of televisions in the staff room and in the lobby. And string coaxial cable to the cafeteria, set up as many televisions you get your hands on and uh, you know, for, for the passengers to view. And the computer uh, IT guy, we said to him, you set up all of the computers we have for, for guest access. Uh, team number three, remove all the non-essential furniture from our cafeteria and set up you know, tables for, for the food that the, the uh, cooks will be bringing in. Uh, team number four and five got out all the classrooms, you know, stack up the desks and chairs, 
and sweep it if you can to prepare sleeping area for, for passengers. Uh, team number six registration set up tables in the lobby that as the passengers came in, get their name and address, contact information, because we had to know who was in the building. And we were instructed by the emergency operations center to keep them you know, in, within the confines of our property. Because if the plane was called to go, we had to know where they were. So we registered them as they came in. Uh, team number seven was an important one as well. We had three uh, registered nurses as instructors in our practical nursing program. And we asked them to intercept the passengers as they came in to see if anyone needed medication for diabetes, blood pressure, heart problems, whatever, or if anyone was in medical distress. So that that you know these these teams did their work and uh, I went on to the, to the campus. Our biggest problem was fine bedding for all these people. You know we were going to get we, we didn't know uh, 280 people we, we thought would be coming. Uh, so my, the minute I got off the phone with my my teams, Nellie got on the phone and started calling around to friends and neighbors. If you have any bedding, if you have a air mattress, if you have a pillow you can spare. Put your name on it if you want, but don't expect to get everything back in one piece. So I went on to the, to the college and Nellie gathered, started gathering up uh, bedding. And all of our staff and the soul told the same thing, uh, you know, that, you know, <laughs> we got all these people, they got to sleep on something, so bring in whatever you can. Uh, around midnight, I got a call from a friend of mine who was a manager of a hotel about 100 miles east of Gander. And she said, you've got a lot of people. Uh, uh, we just changed out the duvets and drapes in 50 of our rooms. You know, do you need that? Uh, you know, can you use that as bedding? I said, bring it on. So around 1.30 in the morning, her van arrived with boxes of duvets and, and, and uh, uh, drapes from her hotel. And we gave them out for people to, you know, to, to co cover them. There's, all we have is a bare tile floor. The very few air mattresses, very few foams, very few cots uh, came in because all over Gander, you know, there, there there's 2,000 odd people staying in Gander itself. So every bit of bedding in Gander was, was being employed. Uh, the first passengers arrived around 9.30. Uh, first bustle of the passengers and most were tired. They had been on, on the, the plane for almost 24 hours and on the tarmac for 24 hours. They were tired, they were anxious, many were scared. Very few knew where they were. Very few had heard of Gander or even of Newfoundland. And they had been boarded their plane, as I said, since leaving Paris, France 24 hours earlier. Uh, we quickly, uh, our, our teams quickly sought out the most tired and distressed and gave them immediate comfort. Most were so tired that they had so much on their minds that we had to think of every need that they had and offer it to them before they knew we had a need. <laughs> that's, that's how, you know, that's the way we felt about it. Uh, once we got them to our cafeteria and we could seat all the people in there, we gave them a half hour, three quarters of an hour to absorb the news, get a bite to eat and get over the shock. And then we introduced ourselves in English and French. Uh, it was an Air France plane. We assumed there was French people aboard and there were. And uh, we told them who we were, where they were and what the arrangements were for food and for sleeping. We told them we had about 30 phones with long distance capability and that we would take them to the phones in groups of 10 and told them that their initial phone call to their loved one relative could be five minutes. But once all of the passengers had been you know, through the line, then they could make the phone call, talk as long as they wanted, as long as they kept it to a, a reasonable length. Uh, we took uh, those who, wanted, who had email, wanted to use computers, we took them to our computer labs and uh, and uh, you know they they did their bit there. Uh, I should add that the passengers didn't have access to their checked luggage. All the checked luggage was in the belly of the aircraft, and none of that was unloaded. 
if they had carry-on luggage and you know in the days pre 911 when you got on a plane as a it's a direct flight let's say from paris to newark new jersey you didn't have a lot of carry-on luggage unless you're carrying a bottle of wine or a bottle of vodka or whatever you know uh, so a lot of these people came in they had nothing they had, they had, they had nothing in the way of, of personal hygiene items or anything else like that but we were fortunate that the Salvation Army had, once they knew the planes were on the ground, they started to put together kits for all of these people. And the, you know, the, the kits would contain a toothbrush, toothbrush, uh, toothpaste, razor, soap, sanitary napkins, whatever, in a Ziploc bag. And uh, around midnight, they, they showed up at the, at the college with boxes and boxes of these kits that we gave out to the passengers. Now, initially we gave out the same kit to everybody, but after a while we learned that we didn't have to put the sanitary napkins in the kit for the, for the men. So we, we start taking them out. But all of this material was do, uh, donated by the department stores and the pharmacies in, in town. Uh, we started to give out blanket sheets and, and pillows to the passengers. And when we ran out of pillows, we gave extra sheets and blankets as far as they would go. We took the passengers to the, our upstairs classrooms, made sure the heat was on because although it was September, you know, it does get chilly at night. So we set them all up and I'll start sharing a screen again. I'll show you a picture of, uh, of some of the, the passengers. This is uh, in our cafeteria. You can see the, the televisions at the time, I mean, flat screens TVs were new. We didn't have them at the college. That's a 27 inch television. And we had one on either wall and that's, that's our passengers looking at the, the television. This is a view from the other angle. Um, and uh, so anyhow, we took them upstairs and, 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 and they, they went to sleep. But over the four days that uh, that we had passengers, uh, my telephone bill at the, the college was normally two or three pages because you had to pay for long distance calls. It's not like today's, uh, you know, uh, unlimited thing. And, uh, but my phone bill normally was two or three pages. At the end of the month, I checked the phone bill, it was 67 pages. And, uh, you know, close to, I think, $30,000 in long distance charge. That's neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, I just want to show you another picture. This is a couple, uh, uh, their, their last name was Bragelman. I forget their first name. But we had a number of, uh, of passengers with young children and, and infants. And our staff and community volunteers came in and, you know, offered to take them home. This particular couple uh, was, uh, they didn't want to leave the group, I, I think, and they were a bit fearful about their surroundings, as, as you would be, and probably didn't trust everybody right away, as, as you would imagine. So friends of ours, uh, who are close neighbors, uh, brought in a crib and a mattress for the baby, and, and baby blankets and everything else, because their daughter had recently had a baby, uh, but they didn't even put the baby in the crib. Uh, as you see in the picture, they, they lay down with the baby between them. And you notice they're lying on sleeping bags. Our, uh, one of the largest hardware stores in Canada is Canadian Tire. Uh, Canadian Tire had their winter inventory in, in their warehouses and they donated hundreds and hundreds of sleeping bags, uh, you know, to us and to the 16 other sites uh, that hosted passengers in Gander. So they had relative comfort, uh, that particular group there. Uh, in the morning, I should tell you this, I suppose. How much time have I got? Uh, I'm starting to wind up. In, in the morning, uh, our cooks, uh, really went to work and the cooking students they were up 5 30 6 o'clock and they cooked up mountains and mountains of scrambled eggs and bacon and bologna we had every kind of fruit and and juice and that you could imagine for you know for the passengers so the passengers they all had a good breakfast and uh 
And then many of them, 150, I think, went on a walk that, that we had organized uh, because we're in such a rush the night before, we didn't get a chance to mop up the, the classrooms where the, where the fashions were sleeping. And I'm sure there's dust bunnies there big enough you know, to, to qualify as, as uh, live animals. So uh, a number of our instructors and students offered to take them for a walk around Cobbs Pond, which is very close to our college as a, a municipal park, probably 150, 200 passengers. Took, took up the offer and that allowed us to, uh, to clean up the classrooms where they're sleeping. Uh, this is one picture, uh, one classroom. You can see that uh, you know, some of the bed-ins were stacked on the, on, the, uh, on the overturned desk, but two people were still sleeping. So we just mopped around them and they didn't wake up. But basically they were living in luxury because one of them had a cot and there's uh, there's only one or two among the, the whole group. And one looks like it's a sleeping mat or an air mattress of some kind. So they were living in luxury. Most just slept on the cold uh, tile floor. And let's see where we are now. Uh, we spend a lot of our time taking the passengers because we had no shower facilities at, at the college. We don't have a gymnasium. We, and other than safety showers, we don't have any of that nature. So a lot of our staff and students uh, transported the uh, passengers to shopping malls and uh, the stores, local stores, uh, quickly sold out of all the popular sizes of underwear and undergarments. And several of our lady passengers I know came back and, uh, and made, they made great mirth in displaying their XL and XXL gander wear undergarments. <laughs> on, on the third day uh, of the passenger stay, the nine wing gander Royal Canadian Air Force Base opened up the shower facilities in their gymnasium. And uh, we spent hours and hours transporting passengers out for their showers and waiting for them. And that's nine, 10 kilometers you know, from, from the college. Uh, our guests came from, from uh, many different countries. I don't think I shared that screen, did I? No, I didn't share the screen. Oh, oh, there, yeah, there, there's, the, there's the passengers uh, sleeping. Uh, before I go on to the, uh, uh, I'm having technical difficulties. There we go. Let's see if we can go back one here. Anyhow, we'll, we'll go with what we got. <laughs> uh, our guests came from uh, many different countries. Some were Americans uh, returning from business or pleasure trips to Europe. Some were guests. Uh, some of our guests were families joining relatives in the United States. Uh, we had the poor, the tired, the hungry, everything that's described on the Statue of Liberty we had. And we didn't know if they were wealthy or poor. We didn't treat them any differently. We had several families, as I said, with young children. And uh, when they didn't want to leave the group, cribs, playpens, filled with toys appeared. Uh, on September 13th, uh, word came that the Air France would be cleared to leave Gander in the evening. And as we gathered the group to say goodbye, many were trying to pay us for our kindness. And of course, we, we couldn't charge them for that. We, we had no intention of doing that. But when I addressed them, here's what I said. And, and I, I, I said, uh, in all the great religions of the world, there's a similar statement of belief about doing good to your neighbor. And in Christianity, the rule is do unto others as you would have to do them do to you in similar circumstances. And we refer to it, most people refer to it as the golden rule. And while we're called upon every day to practice this virtue, no one in their wildest dreams ever expected that we would have to practice it on such a grand scale. Many of you, I said to the pastors, many of you keep asking how you can thank us. Our reply is pay it forward. 
Anytime you get an opportunity to help someone, think of your stay in Gander and do good to others. Uh, we said goodbye to them in the afternoon. They went to the airport and you know it was a long process to get registered, uh, to get checked in uh, because other flights were leaving around the same time. But when they got to the airport, they were told that instead of going to Newark, New Jersey, which is their original destination, uh, they were going to have to go back to Paris because foreign aircraft were not allowed into US airspace. Anyhow, 13 or so of the, of the passengers rebelled and uh, wouldn't refuse to board the plane. That was complicated things because if someone refused to board, all of their luggage would have been taken off. They'd have identified their luggage, everything else put back on. It delayed the flight by several hours. Anyhow, they refused and they chartered a bus to take them to New York City. However, the bus was not available to 7.30 the next morning. So, you know, we had, after they left, we did a quick clean up. I went home, went to sleep. Everybody went home, went to sleep. We were on our feet for hours and hours. And uh, <laughs> we got a call from the, from the emergency operations center that these people were refusing to board and they were coming back to the college for night. So we had to call in our crew and our cooks and, and set up uh, you know, our bedding again. And, but they left the next morning after a hearty breakfast. So we started when they left to clean up the campus and get it ready for normal operations. And at 3.30 in the afternoon, I got a call from the emergency operations center can you take another flight? There's a, a Lufthansa flight 416 with 204 passengers. They've been at a Salvation Army youth camp. Your water supply has gone dry. Uh, can you accommodate them for the night? So we called in our cooks and called in our staff and got ready to, to shelter them for the night. However, they, they were only there at about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the night when they got a call that their flight was boarding. And uh, so they left, and, uh, but the, the regulations had changed, uh, you know, for all flights now, uh, that they couldn't take any liquids on board above a certain amount. They couldn't take any sharp instruments, knitting needles, nail files, nail clippers, pocket knives. They couldn't take any of that aboard. So when they left, they, they left a number of bottles of uh, liquor and beer and everything uh, behind because they couldn't take it with them. So when they left, we sat down, those of us who imbibe and had a, had a drink on our, on our passengers. And then he got open, went into our, our, our staff room uh, uh, supply. Uh, what we didn't know about that flight 416 is that we were their third host in three days. They had been, been at Gander Academy when it was discovered that one of their passengers had a uh, a stomach complaint, a stomach issue, uh, turned out to be food poisoning, but they didn't know it at the time. So the Department of Health separated all of these passengers and, and put them out to the Salvation Army camp. And then the water supply ran dry and of course they, they wound up with us. For us, it was, a, it was a, a, an experience we will never forget. When it was over, I had been on the go for uh, 72 hours with only two hours of continuous sleep and exhausted doesn't begin to describe my condition. It took me several months to before I was able to get a good night's sleep. And I don't know why, but I had, used to have nightmares and troubling dreams. My wife Nellie had been on the go almost as much. She was working daytime uh, with the uh, Newfoundland Power Company and uh, across the street from the college. So, so after work, she would come uh, to the campus and along with her sister, Sue, would uh, man the telephones and handle all the incoming calls and direct passengers to phone for their outcome, outgoing calls. Uh, in December of that year, we held an appreciation evening for the volunteers who who helped out during our 9-11 thing at the college. And we had a list of 150 students, staff, and volunteers. So we had, you know, quite, quite a bit of help. Uh, 
I'm going to share a screen again. Now this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Gander Masonic Hall because this is a Masonic group and I think this is important. This, this won't take very long. Uh, Gander Masonic Hall that you see on your screen uh, was built in 1956. It's seen several expansions and modernizations to keep it up to date. The top floor or the blue room is the meeting space for Gander Lodge number 16. Airways Lodge number 26, Unity Lodge of Installed Masters number 32, Arkley Chapter number three of Royal Arts Masons, Central Council of Royal and Select Masters, and Crossroads Preceptory, Sovereign Great Priory of Canada, as well as the Gander Shrine Club. The downstairs space we call the Square and Compass Club. It has a small private bar, a functional commercial kitchen, a table seating for approximately 120 dinner guests, and all of the above named organizations begin their meetings in September following a two month summer break. Now for many years, a small group of Masons would meet around 4 p.m. and have a sometimes quiet game of cards. On September 11th, the usual group was beginning to gather, but the main topic of conversation was not the weather today or cards, Everyone was aware of the New York City 9-11 incident, and uh, everyone was aware that Gander International Airport was receiving a lot of aircraft. Shortly after 4 p.m., the phone at the club rooms rang, and it was the Gander Emergency Operations Center. And they asked if the club would accommodate 100 passengers from TWA Flight 819. Uh, Don Leet was the building manager for Gander Masonic Hall Company, but he had to get clearance from the president of the Gander Masonic Hall, uh, Hayward Clark, and from the masters of both Gander and Hereway's lodges, the principal tenants. So that permission was quickly granted, and he called the Emergency Operations Center, told them that they were beginning to prepare the building for passenger occupancy. Calls quickly went out to lodge members and their friends to bring in blankets, bedding, and food. The Square and Compass Club has a standing credit account at the Gander Co-op store, and several members, including Gander Masonic Hall President Hayward Clark, were delegated to go to co-op and get enough food to get them through the next 24 hours. The volunteers worked throughout the evening and early morning cleaning and clearing the meeting room and club rooms, making sure to be ready for the guests. The blue room where the Masonic meetings are held has a beautiful English wool blue carpet. It's adorned, as you can see, with the square and compass symbols. This is, by the way, our setup for meetings during COVID. We can accommodate 32, I think, brethren with that configuration. We normally can accommodate up to 90 brethren on the benches and you know, on, on the floor. Anyhow, Don was told that we would be eventually getting cuts, so we decided to cover the carpet with plastic to keep them getting dirty. Cuts didn't arrive until a day or so later, but the 100 guests that we had slept put in a good night on that magnificent carpet. Our square and compass club downstairs is uniquely qualified to feed the passengers from the TWA flight. Regular Masonic social functions are held for Christmas, New Year's, Valentine's, or installation banquets, where our volunteer cooks regularly prepare and serve food for up to 120 Masons and their ladies. Around 3 a.m. on February 12th, the first buses arrived, bringing the, the passengers. As with all host locations, the passengers crowded around a single television and tried to absorb the images of destruction that led them to this tiny town in Newfoundland and Labrador. Right Worship Brother Hayward Clark recalls periods of deathly quiet, followed by exclamations of profound grief and shock as their guests saw the planes impact the Twin Towers. The Masons and their ladies wept with the passengers as they jointly felt the loss inflicted on America. Eventually our guests were led upstairs to the Blue Room where the brethren of both lodges and their ladies gave them blankets and urged them to settle down as best they could to get some rest. The only caution was no food or drink in the sleeping area, and that was done to protect the carpet. Next morning, 
our boys were busy and the breakfast was as good as you get at a quality hotel. Cereals, hot and cold, fruits, juices, eggs, any way you liked them, choice of bacon, such as ham or bologna, white or whole wheat toast, washed down with brewed coffee and orange pico tea. The lunch came from soups and sandwiches and casseroles donated by members and friends of the Masonic community. Later that afternoon, the Square and Compass Club was informed that food was now available at the community ice arena uh, because that became a major storage place for all of the food for the, for the area. The coordination of and uh, food acquisition storage and delivery was being done by the Salvation Army. As with the case at many host sites, some of the more elderly passions were taken into homes of members to give them a more comfortable bed. Over the course of four days, all of the passions were taken home by our masons and volunteers for showers. The building had only one telephone and that created some stress as it was difficult to restrict the length of calls once a passenger had made a connection to a loved one. The phone was in use all night and well into the next day at no charge, of course. Uh, uh, one of our masons, Herb Morgan, uh, uh, he was a volunteer at the Square and Compass Club. He was coming back to the lodge from a food run when he saw a young lady and a young gentleman sitting on the lawn outside the, the lodge. And the young lady was crying her eyes out and the young man could not console her. He went over to see if he could help in any way. And uh, she said that she had been unable to contact her family and he, she knew that they were extremely worried about her. But as Herb was driving back to the, to the lodge, he had noticed that the telephone company, which is only about 300 yards from the lodge, uh, they had set up benches or tables outside of their building and they had 50 or more telephones and these were being offered free to the pastor. So he walked the young lady and the young man over to the telephones, made sure they knew how to get back to the lodge so he came back and, and, and went, went to work. Uh, I'm just about done with this, but every evening, uh, someone would show up with a guitar uh, and entertain the passengers, different, different members of our lodge had different skills. And uh, a friend of, of uh, one of our members uh, often went there with his button accordion and, and played uh, tunes to, Newfoundland tunes to entertain them. Uh, we had at the time a, a Masonic uh, Ladies Auxiliary and these members uh, put in great service as well. Uh, the flight was there until September 14th and it left at 11.50 uh, a.m. on September 14th. So that's, that's the story of, of the Lodge. I'm just going to uh, share the screen again for a moment before I, I clue up. And uh, uh, these, these slides that I'm flipping through here, these are some of the quotes from, from, from the book. But uh, you asked about contact information. As I say, I don't have a publication date for the, for the book as yet, but this is uh, the, uh, the publisher Flanker Press, and it will also be available on Chapters Indigo uh, you know, once it's published. The contact information, if you in, uh, want to inquire, is Ed Olford, his, his email address is there. Uh, my contact information is there. But I, I would recommend that you, uh, that you look me up on Facebook under Mac Moss Author, because every week I upload a little bit of information about the book and some of the stories and quotations and one thing or another. Uh, you know, from, from the book. So if you look up that and like that page, then you'll be, you'll be notified, uh, you know, when, when the book is, is, uh, is to be published. Okay, uh, I'm done, Jim. Uh, anybody got any questions? I take them. Um, actually, we do. I know I, I've got a couple, but I've got Moses Gomez here. Uh, Moses actually works for, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is the current grand historian for the Grand Lodge of uh, New Jersey, and he also works at the Port of New Jersey, so he, he, has, uh, he has his own 9-11 tale, but Mo, um, what's your question? Thank you, Brother Jim. Uh, uh, Brother Mac, uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I guess it means uh, a little bit more to me because I 
responded to the 9-11 attacks here in New York City, both attacks as a first responder here. And uh, my company, I work for Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, actually owns the World Trade Center. We still do. So it's really meaningful for me. Uh, and I do mention a little bit of what happened in Gander in my lecture uh, to honor all of what you did up there. But my question to you was, uh, uh, do how is the reunions? I mean, I know what you all did, but do you still, uh, I've always heard that many still return to reunite with those friends and, and those who extended helping hand on a, on a yearly basis or, or, or so, on, so off, they tried to return back. Uh, how has the relationship been? Have they continued? And is that, is that actually something that still happens to this day where many return to reunite with those who was opened up their hearts and their arms and their homes to them? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the 10th anniversary was a, was a big event. There's several hundred uh, passengers returned. Uh, but uh, of the people who stayed at the college, there's a couple from Morris Plains, New Jersey, uh, two, two ladies. They've been uh, to back to Gander, I think, eight times. They were due last year. They couldn't come because of the pandemic. They're, they're determined they're going to come this year. But again, the, you know, the pandemic might dictate uh, what, what they do. Uh, Kevin Turf, who was one of the characters in the musical Come From Away, uh, he's been here numerous times. And uh, I regularly correspond through Facebook and mail and with probably 10 or a dozen people personally. So anybody that was involved that made friends, uh, you know, keep, keep in contact. So before I get to the next one, uh, you know, Mac mentioned Kevin Turf. Uh, Kevin Turf uh, created a foundation uh, called Channel of, a Channel of Peace. And one of the things he does is that he gives to employ his employees $100. And he tells them to go out and do something nice for someone, anyone. And then we'll come back the next day and we'll talk about it. Yeah. Uh, the thought that somebody would do that is absolutely, that somebody, that's the way, and you talk about paying forward, that's his way of paying forward. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, Don Archer, I see you have your hand up. I accident, but on 9-11, we were in Budapest. We even got letters of condolences from the hotel and what amounts to their city manager. That friendship, you bet. Okay, Julian Wheeler. Thank you, uh, Most Merciful Brother uh, Mendoza. A question for either of our speakers is, um, I mean, I usually like to kind of get a, a, a sense of the entire scope of uh, this phenomenon. And it is a very heartening story about Gander. And I was wondering whether similar experiences out there in other host communities have emerged. And if, if uh, they have also found a way to celebrate this even to the extent of a Tony Award. Uh, I'm just curious about that. Well, I know that all of the communities involved uh, in, in uh, in Newfoundland, and, and uh, I don't know how many communities, probably 25 or 30 in, in total. I know in Gander, there are six communities uh, involved. Uh, you know, they've, uh, their story hasn't been told because m much of the focus has been on Gander. If you do an internet search on Stephenville or St. John's 9-11, you don't, you don't see a lot of information. So I'm hoping that the, you know the sto their stories that I've told in my book will you know will <laughs> give them a little bit of of uh, of reward I guess for their effort. John Brett. Uh, good evening. Thank you, uh, most worshipful. Uh, I know that the, for the last question, uh, there was a, uh, it had to do with uh, was did this something like this occur other places? I know that uh, when they when they first called the airplanes out of the sky. Uh, there was a JAL flight that was overflying um, Anchorage, Alaska. He was not headed into there. He came out of Japan, headed into New York. But uh, they had to stop him someplace or other, and they had a difficult time doing that. And they got past Anchorage uh, before they could actually convince them they needed to land. They landed in, you got to look this one up. They landed in Inuvik um, up in uh, Northwest Territories. 
which I think that I've been in and out of there with what I did for a buck. The point is that there, there can't be more than a thousand people in there. And, and there was almost 350 people. It was packed full of tourists. This uh, JAL flight was, uh, was a, a 747 with as many people as you could put on it. That's the only other one I do know of uh, uh, that we're talking like this. And it was because it was unique in where it went and how it was managed that I even found out about that one. But there were other places where things like this did occur, not on the scale that what took, of what took place at, at uh, Gander, but there were other places where they'd have one or two or three airplanes, which would overwhelm some of these small towns that uh, that they went into. Thank you. Um, Barry Birch. Thank you. Uh, thank you, most forceful. Uh, where was Brother Moss? Uh, if I, if my history is correct, did did, uh, did come from the way actually the cast? Did they actually come to Gander and give a performance? Uh, yes, they did. Uh, before they before they went to Broadway, they they came to our ice arena and did a did a performance. Now they couldn't do it as because it was it, it was a, a sort of a flat stage. But nobody knew the difference, and they did a phenomenal job of telling the story. And you know, I think they did two performances, uh, about 3,500, 4,000 people at each performance. And I can tell you, there was not a dry eye in the, in the house. Uh, I don't know why this moves me so much, and and the people were involved. But today, you know, as I was putting this presentation together, uh, I was listening because Jim put a link to uh, you know uh, some of the cast uh, recordings and and I, I was playing it and as I was playing it I was crying because I can't I can't go there without feeling the emotion uh, that we felt during that time and and one of the emotions that I feel when I listen to that and when I is is uh, is the profound absolute profound exhaustion that I had after that that uh, that event, because as I say, I was seventy two hours on my feet, running on adrenaline, and when I when I collapsed, I collapsed. It was, and most people I talked to, of, of the thousands of people who were involved, expressed a similar sentiment. One of the things I uh, on a previous slide there I, I, is, you know, I, I I talked to people and I asked how how did you do this. You know, you were given a couple of hours notice. You had 300, 400, 800 people. How did you pull it off with such a small crew? And most would say, <clears throat> well, I never done very much. I mean, I was only doing my job. Or I could only be there for 16, 18 hours a day because I had to be back and forth looking after my mother or something like that. Right? And then I say to him, but, you know, you, you corral all these aircraft, you, you entertain, you fed all of these people, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and you say that, well, it was, I was only doing my job or I, I didn't do very much. But, you know, these are absolute jaw-dropping achievements, but people still say, well, I never done very much. And still, they put in all these hours and, and time. So it, it's, uh, I, I get emotional uh, you know, I've seen the the Come From Away musical three times, and I, I I can't watch it. I I you know I immediately the minute music starts, I start crying, <laughs> and I don't know why. I don't know why. Mac, you're not alone on that one. Um, I like to I often indulge myself watching the NPR Tiny Desk concert uh, that Come From Away that the Come From Away cast does, and they do three numbers. Yeah, and you can see the emotion on the cast. They're yeah. just sitting around a table. Yeah. And there, and you and you talk about you know being tired. One of the lines at the at the very end, the, the the gentleman who plays the role of the mayor, he says, he makes a similar comment that you make. He says, "I told my crew to go home, and I mm -hmm. sat down, turned on the TV, and I just cried." Yeah, it was yeah. So yeah, it's amazing. Ryan Leonard, thank you, uh, and. and um, Brother Moss, I enjoyed the presentation. I'm sorry to have come in late, but my Blue Lodge met tonight. Uh, you, you may have already addressed this, but uh, how large of a community is Gander? I just had a curiosity. Uh, at the time of 9-11, Gander had a population of, of 9,700 people. It's now about 11,000, 11,500. Doug Fountain. 
Yes, Rabbi Worshipful Moss, thank, thank you for your presentation. You talked a lot about the transportation requirements and you talked about transporting guests to showers and shopping and and all around the, the community. And I'm wondering how you guys arrange for all the transportation resources and where all the transportation resources came from. Uh, initially, to get them from the airport to the shelters, it was it was uh, school buses. I mean, that was the only, there was no commercial bus service available. But the school board in the whole district had about uh, 85, 90 school buses. Hmm. And 65 or 70 of those were employed in, in uh, going to the airport, taking them from the aircraft to the terminal and then from the terminal to, to their shelters. Uh, once they got to shelters, uh, the volunteers at the shelters transported them around, took them on tours, took them shopping, uh, you know, took them to stores, took them to the pubs, whatever they, they had to go. It was all done by volunteers. Hmm. Um, let's see, Rich Hallett, I believe you were before Jeff Jackson. So Rich, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Jeff Jackson, you're next. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I was, uh, uh, thank you, most worshipful. Um, I, uh, Brother Moss, uh, I was wondering if you, uh, uh, heard about any, uh, uh, Masonic family, uh, connections, uh, with the passengers that, uh, landed in Gander. I, I haven't personally uh, heard of any. Uh, the, the unique thing about the Masonic Lodge in, in Gander at the time uh, is that if you're a Mason, I mean, I, I was a Mason, but I was working at the college. If you were a, a, a member of a, a certain church congregation, you most likely volunteered at your church. If you're a teacher at a school and a Mason, you, you did your work at the school. So uh, I'm, I'm aware of only a couple instances where Masons, where there, where there are Masons and the passengers who actually uh, wound up at, at, at Masonic Hall. But I don't, I haven't followed them up. I don't know their names. I don't know if they kept in contact or not. Uh, Jeff mm -hmm. Jackson. Thank you, illustrious Brother Mendoza. Mac, um, I am a ham radio operator and I'm very glad to hear that we were of use, <clears throat> our ham radio operators were of use. Um, what mode of communication, VHF, UHF or HF, what, what did you all use? Uh, well, mostly VHF when we, when we participated with the airports in their, in their uh, emergency simulations. Uh, one of the things about, about our services at that time is that the fire department couldn't talk to the, to the, you know, the town fire department couldn't talk to the airport fire department. They were different frequencies. They couldn't talk to the ground crew at the airport. They couldn't talk to the, you know, the, the airport couldn't talk to the town mobile, you know, police or the mobile vehicles. So the ham radio setup used to be a central location with a number of these radios and we would just forward calls from one, one service to another, uh, you know, as required. But during 9-11, there's, there's none of that. Uh, most of it was handled by phones. Very few people had cell phones at the time. Uh, so most of it was handled by, by landline. So Mac, I've got a couple questions. Number one, uh, the passengers were told they, they couldn't take anything off the airplane. No doubt there were people who had to have prescription medication. How yeah. was that handled? Uh, <laughs> in, in a number of ways, uh, in the first instance, while the planes were, were the passengers were on the planes, uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, ambulance drivers or EMTs from the local hospital, they went aboard every aircraft and they inquired if anybody was in immediate need of diabetic medication or blood pressure medication, that sort of, thing. because most people had their, their, their pills or medications in their in their packed luggage, which is in the belly of the plane. So that's one way. Uh, when they were deplaning, the uh, hospital had a field group of uh, doctors and nurses at, at the terminal, <clears throat> and anybody who needed anything could, uh, could avail of it there. Once they got to their shelters, uh, uh, again, they could contact the hospital 
uh, and they would make sure that medication was, was delivered to them. Uh, the local hospital uh, dispensed uh, $10,000, $12,000 worth of medication over four or five days. The pharmacies dispensed, the two pharmacies in town dispensed, uh, you know, a lot of medication, unknown, unknown uh, quantity or unknown dollar value. But everybody who needed medication was attended to because public health nurses would visit all of these shelters. And, uh, you know, if anybody needed anything, it was immediately obtained. And the other question I had was that I know that you, you, I know the story. The story goes that you guys said, no, we were here, paid, paid forward, but money, should, but I understand that things came back to you guys. In, in, in what way? <laughs> well, let's see. I understand like um, uh, <clears throat> there was, a, there was somebody, somebody from the Rockefeller Foundation who uh, bought new computers for the high school. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I understand all this. Several scholarships were set up. Yes, in, in most places that hosted passengers, uh, the passengers were, were, were very generous. Uh, if it was a school, there's a number of schools that had scholarships set up. As you mentioned, the Rockefeller Foundation donated a full suite of computers to a, a, a junior high school. Uh, in the College of North Atlantic, uh, the passengers on the first day at lunchtime, a box appeared and on the side of that box was the AF 004, Air France 004, passenger or college scholarship fund. And they were encouraging each other to put money in there. That eventually uh, came back to the college at about $16,000 Canadian, I think. And that uh, set up a, a, a bursary that ran for, I think, 15, 16 years before it eventually ran out of money. And uh, interesting, we gave, uh, each class had to vote on a person in their class who exhibited the kindness and caring displayed by the volunteers of 9-11. And so you're basically giving a scholarship to a nice person. And so that was always one of my, one of my uh, great pleasures. Even after I retired, they invited me back to present that particular scholarship. In, uh, in the high school in Lewisport, the scholarship fund, I think, was uh, it's now grown to close to a million dollars. And uh, pretty well every graduate gets, uh, you know, something from their scholarship fund. So uh, a lot of people, there was a lot of payback. There's a lot of pay it forward going on. And I also understand that uh, Gander is the only foreign territory that has a piece of 9-11 steel. Uh, for a while it was. I'm not sure anymore. We have, uh, we have uh, two pieces, one piece, three pieces. We have one piece at the Aviation Museum, uh, a piece at the Town Hall and a piece at the airport. And in the, in the town of Appleton, which is 15 miles up west of here, they have a, a 21 foot piece in their, in their piece park. But uh, who put pieces of steel in the piece park? Amazing. You know, when I think about Gander and when I think about Come From Away and I, and I listen to your story, the, the word kindness just keeps popping up all the time. Uh, amazing what happens when you lead with kindness. And so with that, Lustrous Brother Al Jorgensen, I, I offer I offer the last word to you. I offer the last word to you if, for all intents and purposes. <laughs> well, there's not much else we can say after a tremendous story like that. It uh, was a tremendous experience, uh, both for those of us that uh, were not placed in such a, uh, if you will, traumatic experience of uh, hosting that many people in a very short period of time, but doing it in such a magnif magnificent manner as to uh, really create uh, not only a fantastic musical, but now uh, uh, a legacy that is carried forward in the forms of scholarships, etc. cetera. Uh, Mac, uh, most excellent brother, uh, I want to thank you very much for taking the time. I know the hour is very late there, so my comments are going to quit right now and say thank you ever so much for your excellent presentation to us this evening. Oh, thank you for having me, and I've got to do the same for for uh, the Duke of Connaught Lodge in North Vancouver in, in two weeks' time. <laughs> so, Barry, I hope you'll send that link out to, to, to me so that way I can go ahead and get it to share it with everyone. I also want to thank most worship brother Ian Murray uh, for, for, for staying up late as well. Um, again, it's 
if I do my math right, it's 1245 Newfoundland time. And I, it's when I say 1245, I mean 1245 AM. So most excellent brother, Mac, right worshipful sir, most worshipful brother, Ian, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, recording this. I mean, it's recorded. I'm looking forward to getting it uploaded to our website so other people can enjoy it as well. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Thank you, brother. Good night. Bye-bye, everyone. Good night. Good night.